This episode is sponsored by Microfocus and the LoadRunner Solutions family. That includes LoadRunner Professional, Enterprise, Cloud, and Developer. You know, performance matters. Did you know that LoadRunner Solutions have the largest community of practitioners in the world? Join that community at community.microfocus.com, scan the QR code, and check out the LoadRunner family page on performance engineering, as well as their YouTube playlist that we've got links for in the show notes on smcjournal.com as well as YouTube. This episode is sponsored by Supervisor. Stop losing money with a slow website. With Supervisor, you can continuously track the performance of your code and your hosting. Predict site page load speed with high user volumes and an easy one-click load test solution. Find out more at supervisor.com. A special edition of the SMC Journal podcast. Normally, I'm doing this virtually on a like a conference call, but I actually am on site today in Detroit, Michigan, with my longtime friend Ryan Folk of Folk Consulting. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being on the show. Absolutely. So I wanted to do this uh, because we have known each other for um, a long, long time. Yes, sir. Probably longer than we we both want to admit. And we've been doing performance testing engagements for a long time. And we've seen a lot of change in the industry, especially in the last, say, five years. Yeah, for sure. You run Folk Consulting. I do. So tell me a little bit about you, because I know about you, but the the viewers do not. Tell me about you, and tell me about Folk Consulting and what you do. Sure. So uh, Folk Consulting was founded in 2002. I essentially created Folk Consulting Services Incorporated mm-hmm. um, over a weekend in uh, in April of 2002. Wow, yeah. it's been that long. Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, the company I worked for was a company called Decision Consultants, which was actually based right up the road here in Southfield, uh, run by a gentleman by the name of Jack Grizzula. And uh, they had a, another office down in Tampa, Florida, which is the one I worked out of, and that was a Mercury Interactive uh, partner back in the Mercury days, as we like to say, right? They hired me uh, to be a Mercury Interactive uh, load runner and wind runner consultant, essentially. And Decision Consultants uh, was acquired by Cyber Incorporated, uh, and they were an IBM reseller at the time, and uh, they didn't have a a practice, if you will, um, for Mercury Interactive Consultants. And so I made a decision to basically go independent at that point. And Ford Motor Company, uh, through Cyber, asked me to uh, stay on, and uh, I created Folk Consulting through that motion. There were a handful of people that sort of wanted to do something very similar, and basically within a matter of about two weeks, I had about five or six people working with me. Wow, that was quick. <laughs> I, and I was about 25 years old. <laughs> yeah. So uh, my wife is in the accounting world, the finance world, more specifically. So she's been able to help me uh, steer the ship for all these years, uh, 20 years this year. And so that's how I got it all started. (laughs) Wow. And uh, I worked at Ford, uh, I worked at Ford until 2009. Right. And then then getting into a a realm when we were actually working with, at the time, what then at the time was the HP partner groups. Right. While also focusing on some of the some of the cooler technology that was starting to come up with different various vendors like like Dynatrace for instance mm-hmm. and, and like uh, uh, you know through through in the you know 2015 you know the neo loads and, mm-hmm. and 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 the like and, and we were doing a lot of very different different things in the in the performance space um, but fundamentally the core of where we started from was Mercury Interactive and, and HP so you've been doing 
performance testing has been a big part of your practice. I know you, you did uh, functional automation as well. You know, there was a yeah. gamut of things that you were doing. Yeah. Uh, and also uh, some of the first APM stuff, you yes. know, when Topaz turned into Business yeah. Availability Center and we were right. all working with those things. That's right. Uh, that's sort of when that whole APM space came involved. That's but right. how much has performance and performance monitoring played a role in your company? Is it like the majority thing that you do or is it just equal? So I would say from a revenue perspective, it's about a third of our business. Okay, that's um, significant. Yeah, for sure. Um, we, have, we have five different business silos. Again, performance is one of them. Test automation, as you alluded to, is another. Uh, we have an ITOM, ITSM practice uh, that centers from the business availability center that you did. It kind of stems from that, a little, if you will. And then IT service management is a, is a uh, something we've, we've, we've been actively involved in for the last, last four years. We have our own ITSM organization fundamentally because we do support for a number of software vendors and partners that uh, sell software themselves and, and have clients that need support tickets and, and a little bit more uh, direct hand-holding, if you will, for enablement of how they implement their software and solve problems that they see within their organization. That's all very, very much what we do. Um, so question, um, you have seen in this amount of time span, I mean, I'm sure you've seen pretty much everything, all the problems that a company can have at very, in different size companies with regards to performance. What do you see today versus when you first started out around the kinds of problems? Is, is it still the same struggle for companies? Is it still the same basic issues? Uh, or are they changing? Are the problems changing that, you're, that your clients are struggling with? It's a great question. I would say in performance testing, there is a lot of the old, mm -hmm. but there is a tremendous amount of the new mm -hmm. as well. I would say automation testing um, with the aspect of Agile, mm -hmm. the aspect of pipelines, the aspect of CICD, um, those things are significantly different than where they were five and ten years ago. And the people who are doing this, are they developer roles that are wanting to solve these problems? You still deal with pure QA uh, automation where there's a there's a performance person in the QA team or is it has it all been shifted left into development now? So no, it's it's both. Is it? Yeah, for sure. We we strive to deliver what we consider to be self service models mm -hmm. to customers. And what I would consider to be self-service platforms from the software vendors that we tend to work with. The ability to properly create a, a true functional automated test or a end-to-end -end performance test, two very different things, mind you, and making sure that the requirements that are gained from the, the results or the continuous results you get out of those types of tests is not something as you know like a, 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 anybody that's developing software is looking for a pass or fail criteria of how that's implemented in a lot of cases right mm -hmm. in performance testing there is no such thing as pass or fail it's you have you have gray areas of analysis that's right yeah. right and so where do you see more of the developer shift left type of approach um, you see that more in automated testing for sure than you do performance testing. I see. But, but we still see more collaboration with developers or even with production teams mm -hmm. that want to understand why things are behaving in production the way that they're behaving. Right. You do that through simulation with performance testing, of course, right? You develop better regression scenarios to remediate a lot of that through potential automation, but for the most part, you're trying to accomplish a goal that's not typically done through an ops team or a development team. It's it's a QA type of a role okay. that, that usually is more a part of that team. 10 years ago, it was throw it over to the QA team. Mm -hmm. So the shift left that you see is really that wall coming down. It's like those cubes out there. You can see the person over you mm -hmm. and you can collaborate on what they're doing versus, hey, when this is done, my part's over, it's over on that side, they're doing their own thing, and 
you know, we'll get some results out of it and then make a decision on whether or not we, we pass this gate or we, we pass this release or something along those lines. W when you get into a more of an iterative approach, everybody needs to be actively involved in what that iter iterative approach is and how that iterative approach is, is agreed upon within that scrum team or development team or, or whatever we're calling it, right, in terms of how, that, how that's being released. A lot of the performance testing we're doing is, is a lot of that model. But there's also a, a, a decent amount of customers that we get that say, we have not been focusing on performance testing or we have not been focusing on automation. And all of this is either taking too long uh, um, or, or a lot of this is performing poorly and, and we, need to, we need to figure out, we just can't keep scaling our cloud or we just can't keep scaling our infrastructure. We have to get to the bottom of how we make this perform better as it relates to our, the quality of our software. Got it. And those are quality discussions, not development, not ops conversations. Interesting. I don't want to talk about DevOps specifically sure. because that has taken over the IT world by storm. There's a lot of conversations about it. And I, I always try to ask this question from somebody who pre-DevOps, pre you know, whirlwind to, to currently today. Sure. You talked about bringing those silos down, where you can see over the top. Yep. DevOps was supposed to do that for us. But to me, my soapbox is <laughs> there is this assumption that the QA role in between there is covered by the development side. That dev and QA are now combined to get that part done, and then op you know we work with and communicate with operations. I don't know about you and how you feel about it, but as a performance engineer and a tester at heart, it seems very presumptuous to think that the QA roles can be assimilated by development because that's not the only place where QA should play a role. It should be throughout everywhere. There's, I mean, testing doesn't just start or end with code. There's especially performance. There's network. There's after the fact. There's the performance monitoring. There's every aspect where performance can play. And developers, historically, in my opinion, do not make good testers. So where do you stand on that? Because I don't see DevOps really ever solving that problem for QA. It's just sort of glossed over it. And if you're not doing what the cool kids do, get with it, old man. You know, that's kind of what I, the way I feel. Do you, do you feel that? So it's, it's a good observation. I think you could make several discussion paths about what that really is. To me, it's, it's enterprise culture. DevOps is a way that people like me, people like the, the big SIs, uh, people like uh, sales reps, that they sell, whether it's digital transformations, whether they sell DevOps, it's it's a thing. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between DevOps and DevSecOps? Right. The, the answer is it's a, it's just a phrase, right? Like, right. it's a culture that you're trying to create within one's organization. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a it's a set of procedures that you're using with, whether it's it's a, a, you know safe, uh, you know scaled agile frameworks, mm -hmm. right? To make sure everybody mm -hmm. understands what that is. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's just the culture of what you're attempting to do and then fundamentally your technical debt that you have within your organization that allows you to accomplish those goals. There is a, a customer that we talked to a handful of years ago where they had developed true DevOps mm -hmm. uh, straight from code releases, whether they be part of agile sprints or issues that came in through their ITSM, whether it be ServiceNow or you know, Avanti or, or, or uh, you know, IFS or, or any of those, you know, ITSM organizations that tickets go in for hot fixes mm -hmm. and then they get put into pipelines with other builds to get released, if right. you will, right? right? And this organization had created a pipeline that allows for not only automated testing but performance testing for the code that was ultimately being developed. And in this case, the CIO of that organization was thrilled because of the amount of testing, the amount of feedback, the amount of reporting that they were getting for this part of the business. That part of the business made up 4% uh, mm. of 100% of the IT org. 
And the question was, is how do I scale that to 16% in a year or higher in two or three years? And when you fundamentally get down to it, they couldn't scale their people because it's, if it's continuous, there's still some activity that's allowing that to be continuous. You are working faster, and in some cases you are working smarter, but, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to fundamentally truly scale sure. without the people. And then the people that are doing that, I mean, they have to be bought in, mm -hmm. right? It could be the, the same thing as the difference between a well-run football team and a not-run well football team. Right. Do, do you think it gets down to skill sets? I mean, it's just oh, people, we're just missing so many fundamental skill sets that we need desperately in, in IT. And that specialization, especially when it comes to performance, we need that and we don't have it. Is that f just a fundamental problem why you can't scale this? Stuff? Well, in some cases, it's, it's just the fact that there's so many different ways to build technology. Mm. Okay. Right? Like, how many times have people talked to you about, hey, we do everything in JavaScript and no, we do everything in Python? Right. I, I mean, as an example, right? Like, here, all, all of our animation is done in Ansible. Okay, well, ours is done in Python. Well, but besides the technology, I mean, whether you're doing it in JavaScript or Python, there are certain things, there are certain qualities and, and fundamental skill sets that you need to, to test something like that functionally or do a performance test on it or, and even, even for one, just to see if the code passes, much less load testing and sure. all those other things. Um, that's what I see this mass void in the market for. So some of that has to do when we talk about performance testing around self-service. So there are solutions out there like LoadRunner Enterprise, like NeoLoad, like BlazeMeter, as examples, that provide platforms now that are truly, they can be set up for self-service. Mm -hmm. But Scott, that, that's been in the last 18 months. Right. Like people talk about the fact that they've had this for years, and and like you can build you can build that out, but it's not scalable. Right. There are scalable self service models within the technology that's available to people within the speaking of performance testing, mm -hmm. of of things that you're able to do now that weren't available eighteen months ago or available at scale. Right. And I, and you can teach a developer to run. And I'm sorry to interrupt. You can teach a you can teach a uh, a developer how to performance test, but remember, it's not a pass or fail criteria. It's still a very great criteria. Now that gray mass, if you will, goes gets s smaller and smaller. The more continuous and the more you learn, mm -hmm. you know, everybody talks about AI, right? What is AI? AI is a set of rules that learn. Right. Well, it's the same thing with people, right? If they're developing that code and they're implementing automation or they're implementing performance testing. In the case of performance testing, like we said before, it's not necessarily pass or fail. It, it's it, it's an assumption of information that you're getting that allow you to make a better decision. Mm -hmm. And then if the decisions, if you make a series of bad decisions, well, guess what happens? You have poor performance of an application. If you make a series of good decisions, then you probably won't have performance issues very often in, in your environment, right? And, I, mm -hmm. and so, but, to say that developers, because we keep saying, I don't think developers are, are testers. They're sh so they can be testers. Can they be performance engineers? You don't. You very, very, very rarely see that. I mean, I know they exist, much like For unicorns sure. supposedly do exist. <laughs> full stack engineers or full stack developers sometimes exist. They all tend to work for Google and places that can actually afford to pay them well to do their job well. So Most not, certainly. but Bob's Meat Shack down the road isn't going to be able to necessarily hire those people. They have great meat, but they have poor IT. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so you you've mentioned continuous in the last few minutes several times, and this is something I specifically wanted to get to. Performance testing has been in the past a an event. It's major release. It's every six months. It's whatever. And agile development says, you know, you can do that more often. And my analogy has always been, it performance testing was a steam cleaner. Okay. You know, we brought it out every six months when there was a big mess we had to clean up suddenly. Sure. Then with agile, it became the dishwasher. We can actually do this every day or multiple times a day. We can. But now it has to be like the refrigerator. It's always on, it's always doing what it does, and it should always be providing value. That's kind of how I describe continuous testing in general, but mm -hmm. specifically 
integrating that performance testing as a continuous thing, which is easier said than done, and I realize that. I'm wondering, from your experience over the last few years, how many clients have you seen that have actually been able to implement continuous performance testing, if at all, and are they doing it well, or is that something that a lot of them are struggling with? Maybe they're still trying to get the steam cleaner going. Sure. You know, how many of them are at that refrigerator level? So I would say a decent amount of customers that we are either working with or we are uh, guiding from time to time. So the steam cleaner is, is a mess, right? So we, we, get a, we get a decent amount of those phone calls, whether they are current customers or they are, we had a net new customer last week that has a steam cleaner situation and, and, and our team has been working quite frankly around the clock to turn a four week project into eight days kind of a thing, <laughs> right? Um, and, and that's not uncommon for some of the things that, w that we do. A at some point though, in, in the analogy that we use is we're on the hamster wheel and, and you can still put us in the hamster cage, but we gotta make sure that we at some point are off the wheel, right? right. Um, you know, you, ju you can't keep going at 100 miles an hour all the time, but part of the engagement within the performance testing space is you've got to be prepared to go 100 miles an hour a couple of times a year mm -hmm. uh, because in some cases it's either very last minute or um, uh, towards the end of a cycle when you're trying to go live and everything gets condensed and it is what it is. We've seen that for years and years and years and years. Mm -hmm. um, or it's, you know, we have uh, true production issues and, and we, need, we need to get, figure out why r right this minute, right? So that's the steam cleaner in our, in our world. The, the dishwasher is when a customer is, kn is knowing that they're, they're doing testing at a couple of times a year and we have to make sure that the scripts that we create are either hardened, small enough, or self-service capable easily maintainable so I don't like the word easy maintain because there's a certain way that that's like it's either this big or this big in, right. in someone's definition right so self-service capable means that anybody in this organization that has access to that you know ability to create that performance test can go do it I see. right so because someone could say well someone it's super maintained well is it super maintained for the guy that's been here 10 minutes right <laughs> Yeah, it's a different story. Right, but can the guy who's been here for 10 minutes press a button and then produce a result that someone will fundamentally be able to to say, okay, now I understand what that says. And the guy who's been there for 10 minutes said, I just pressed a button. Because in some cases, uh, even early back in my career, <laughs> as a performance engineer, I've been called a button pusher. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, like why can't they just go push a button? Right. Uh, <laughs> okay. Apparently, I'm a button pusher now, right? Like, yeah. it happens, right? It, it does. It happens. I, before I actually got into QA, there was a QA department, and I always saw these automated things running on the screen, these yeah. GUIs, and I didn't even know what, what it was back then. And when we had some meeting or something, I was like, well, all you do is just push a couple of buttons and the stuff plays back. And they were like, yeah, that's exactly what we do. Yeah. <laughs> you know, real cynical. Just, like that. just a couple of very handsome button pushers. And then I realized it was a lot more than that. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's the that's the that's the dishwasher in, in your analogy to get to to get to the, the the refrigerator this is where self-service truly comes into play right you never know when you need to provision load generators through the cloud so you need to make sure you have tight cloud provisioning you need to understand that the scripts that you're going to be using are very very well maintained or or or, or very self-service capable mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and and they are there's a certain level of repeatability for all of that so that you're not necessarily waiting for whether it's the true qa or if it's the true architect what whoever it is that's doing the test in this case depending upon the organization it, in order for it to, for it to truly be the refrigerator mm -hmm. in in your analogy we have to be in a position where it self-service is a big part of what's happening. So do we see a lot of refrigerators? We do not. We do not. I think that's where we have to go if we want to keep up with where software is being developed these days sure. and how it's being deployed in 
fast environments like Kubernetes, containerized, sure. where the environments may be here for an hour and they're not even here anymore. I mean, so yeah. we have to be very, very fast about that. So ha having said all of that, you know, not only have you been doing this for quite some time, you've got a lot of team members that have been here for a while and doing this, and they've seen a lot and done a lot, which is why, you know, clients call you, have you seen this? Yeah, we've probably seen it before. Have you ever dealt with it? Yeah, we probably have. And that just comes with experience. Can you talk a little bit about your team and the kind of capabilities that you actually have? Because I know you can do some pretty advanced stuff with some of the, the load testing tools. Sure. I think the last time we looked, uh, Brian said we had over 300 years of performance testing on staff. It's impressive. Across six different solutions. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, so there isn't a lot. We, we take a very agnostic approach to things because we have to. Mm -hmm. uh, whether that's by cost, whether that's by this is what we have and you're going to use what we have, or whether we have a managed service that brings it with us. Right. And so at that point, we need a functional model with whatever software vendor we are using an MSP for, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes the client just says, just get it done. We don't care what you do. Sure, and then the, you know, fundamentally, just like with anything with, you know, automated testing, or, but more specifically with performance testing, the number one problem you're gonna have is data. Mm -hmm. The number two problem you're gonna have is data. And the number three problem you're going to have is data. And then you get into what you're actually trying to accomplish. Right. Then the environment, don't forget about so that. So <laughs> the environment is usually, but with the onset of cloud, I will say that that is starting to get easier and easier and easier. But the data conversation still is significantly challenging. Um, and then timing uh, still is a, is a challenge uh, because these sprints, if you will, uh, make make things challenging. It's it's. You never get off that hamster wheel at some time. So as it relates to our team, our team has to be very, very flexible, which they are. They have to be able to work at different hours, which we do. We are, quite frankly, strategically placed around the globe to be able to handle handoffs and be able to handle um, sort of those steam cleaning moments where, you know, we, we have to pull people from different spots at times to, to you know, make sure we're continuously making progress and, and solving some of the single sign-on problems we're having or the environment problems we're having or or any of those things that we're having but again all of that's run by a, a, one, a one individual again on the team and and, and he manages a, a a pretty vast group of people that that have seen a lot of these problems and so we we approach it as a you know leveraging slack and other communication uh, uh it communication capabilities that obviously are very uh, very apparent in today's organizations, especially post-pandemic, of mm -hmm. course, right? Mm -hmm. We've been able to, we call it the brain trust, right? You're, you're, you're not getting a consultant, you're getting a team. Right. right? I, I like that. I like the way you, you phrase that, too. What about the kinds of work that you're getting requests for now? Is it is it still, um, is it more than web? Are you still getting calls for things like, you know, legacy products like Citrix or terminal emulation or uh, other other things outside the typical website? So the, the answer to that is yes. Um, most of those conversations tend to be like we're trying to push this to the cloud and we need to have proper testing automated or performance around. Are, are we seeing any degradation when we make these shifts? I see. They call it lift and shifts. Right, right? sure. Yeah. So we see a lot of that. It's still a lot of everything. It's SAP, it's Oracle, it's Homegrown, it's SaaS platforms. It's, uh, we just did a, a, a performance test for a, an organization that had a hybrid IT model, on-prem, cloud, uh, legacy, brand new, spaghetti together. We can't have our, uh, our students, uh, uh, our, our teachers, excuse me, uh, filling out attendance cards. Mm. for XYZ school boards in XYZ part of North America. We, we've got to be able to do this because the, the school season's starting, right? Mm -hmm. And so what were we doing this summer? We, we were helping them identify where those problems were, right? right? We were trying to show them which parts of their application they should be focusing on first, right? Yeah. And that was a, a, a steam cleaner <laughs> moment, yeah. right? And, uh, and we, put them in off, we put them on a path to be more Dishwasher safe, right? <laughs> I love it. See, it's taken off, folks. Well, is there anything else that you want to talk about about full consulting or any, any shout outs or anything you want to say about what you're doing? So I, fundamentally, as it relates to performance, this this is a, a performance podcast, right? There's, there's other aspects of our businesses we were talking about off camera. Mm -hmm. 
you know, performances where we, we, we sort of, you know, supplanted our roots, if you will, as, as an organization. Test automation was, was not far behind uh, uh, as it relates to what we, what we do as a company. We, we have an IT operations management and ITSM practice. We have a support organization that white gloves customers either through um, SVI contracts or through you know white glove type services where our response times are sub five minutes for most tickets that get put into our portal where you're put on the phone with somebody who's ultimately trying to help you solve that ticket almost immediately. We have a we have an SAP practice that centers itself around solution manager and what's coming in the SAP space around Cloud ALM. Okay. Uh, we, we also have a, a Power BI data analytics sort of RPA practice that stems off of the automation practice that's more centered around you know, production automation okay. as well as getting analytics off of that through various forms like Power BI, Power Automate, Tableau, Grafana, things of that nature. Who are some of the partners that you have? Uh, MicroFocus? So MicroFocus is most certainly a partner that stems from the HP, the HPE, Mercury Interactive legacy chain, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, actively working with Tricentis, on a, we've made a significant investment in the, uh, their, their certification accreditations. We work with, on the ITOM side, we work with, with Xenos, we work with ScienceLogic, we work with MicroFocus. Uh, we work with New Relic, we work with Dynatrace, we work with Splunk. Um, in the, uh, again, the, the, the Power BI space, so, I mean, that's, that's sort of self-service with mm -hmm. Micros uh, Microsoft, but again, Tableau and, and Grafana. Uh, we, we are going to be at ASUG for the SAP conference in Newtown Square next week, okay. presenting on integrations across a number of platforms. So and you also do some cloud, I mean, some uh, open source uh, project like so if somebody wants to use JMeter, you, yep. you still do that. We still do that around. The, uh, so there's a couple of different platforms. Most people know about Blaze Meter, of course, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a couple of platforms around that. Uh, Selenium frameworks. Okay. We're we're going to be. We just signed a customer just this week that is going from uh, Selenium to UFT, and we're helping with that transformation because it's a pretty uh, ingrown situation with regards to how UFT developer works okay. these days, right? So. Again, it's. It, I think currently we're staffing 50 projects. Awesome. Yeah, for for our little boutique firm with the lowercase b. <laughs> no, that's great. Good. No, and it's it's good to get uh, insight from a company like yours, where some the people who view this, you know, that most of them are working at one company. They're yeah. working on one project sure. or a couple of projects. They don't get to see the forest because they're focused on their tree, right? right? So you get to see all this cross plane of everything. And that's a great perspective to have to let them know, number one, you're probably not alone in the problems that you're having. No, and you're probably, you know, and building a community around that and sharing is a, is a good way to, you know, get the support that you need for that. And then also some of the trends that you're able to see of where people are going as they're trying to progress to the next level. You can kind of see, uh, you know, what's, what's around the bend three, six months from now and start building plans to be able to help solve those problems for others. In, in terms of the things that I look at as, as a CEO, you know, a leader of people, if that's what we're calling it, right? Mm -hmm. We've got to be able to listen to the people that work with us and, and get their perspective on what's working and more specifically what trends are actually taking hold. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of really interesting technology that's out there, but there's only some that really take hold. Right. 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 And, and so you, you've got to consistently evaluate that. Every quarter is probably a little too much. Every half year, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, every year, absolutely. You, you you need to pay attention to what where the puck is moving in a different and, and a number of different aspects as to what's truly going to help an organization. But the fundamental core facts of what it is that we do, the the, the base of what we do, you know, you can build off what we've been, what you and I, for instance, have been working on for two decades now. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. Oh yeah. my gosh. That's still the core of what it is that we're we're really truly capable of doing, and then and then growing upon that. Because some people have never done, in the case of performance testing, we've never done performance testing before. Mm. Scott, it's twenty twenty two, right? Yeah, like really. Yeah, and and I I kind of attribute that to the fact that I find myself stuck in time thinking, well, everybody else is do, still doing performance testing because I'm still doing performance testing 20 years ago. No, those people have moved on to other positions. Some people are out of IT. Some people are now managing organizations. They're the CIOs now or the CEOs. 
it's not the same people. And no. so it, the next generation that comes behind and all these things, did we leave behind enough to help them? And some of them are starting right from scratch again. And I kind of look at myself and think, you know, maybe I should do a better job of leaving that knowledge to the next generation. Maybe we haven't done as good of a job of it, and that's something maybe I can help with. Well, the fact that you've uh, put out the number of videos that you've had, <laughs> over, especially in the last year and a half, right? That's You're leaving them. I mean, that ain't going anywhere last no, time I checked. Hopefully. <laughs> hopefully people get something out of it. For sure. But, uh, yeah, but there are people out there, like the people that work with Folk Consulting, that they've been around, they've done it, and there's a lot of stuff in here, and a lot of them have documented it and shared it. I think the more we share that knowledge out there, the, the better off everybody is going to be because I don't care if you're using bare metal, virtual machines, containers, or whatever's next. The laws of physics haven't changed. That's when right. you run out of resources, things start sucking. Let's figure it out That's where right. that is, That's where right. that is, and, and build that, you know, fix for that. So those are the, those are the fundamental skill sets that people need to know. But um, with, with people that have been experienced the way that your consultants have, it's, it's, it's good to know that you can call somebody like that who has seen that before and, uh, and get the benefit of those years of experience. It's really our, important. Yeah, our view of the world is, is quite deep in, yeah. in the performance space, for sure. Our, our right. view of the world and our view of many different circumstances, many different conditions, many different problems, yeah, our, our view of the world is, you know, if they, if they like to say it's a mile wide and an inch deep, yeah. our, our view of the world is, uh, 100, 300 yards wide and a mile and a half. Deep. Yeah, yeah, and that's right. great. So that's 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 the analogy that I would use there for sure. Well, I want to say it's been great being up here in yeah. Michigan. I was actually here for a, a conference this week, but it was Ryan's hometown, so I wanted to come see him when I when I was here. And, and also, thank you for being a sponsor for the SMC Journal. We really appreciate You're it welcome. because that goes towards everything that I'm doing, but it also supports the community of course. In, a, in a wider way. So thanks, Ryan, for being on hey, the show. Thank you. And you're always welcome back anytime. Uh, and, and you're welcome here as well. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks.